Tesla, Rivian, Ford, Sony, Apple. What is the common denominator? Electric vehicles. They're the cars of the future with more and more on the roadways each year. But what challenges and consequences will switching to full EVs have? That and more in today's episode. I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. Welcome to Rock Logic. I'm your host, Sean Kenny. And before we get started, I want to ask you to hit the like button, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. Today, we will be discussing a huge problem that no one seems to be talking about. Electric cars have been getting a lot of attention lately, and this year will be no exception. Tesla, Rivian, Ford, even Apple is considering a major push into this hot new market. And while I'm very excited about this transition in the coming years, I have several concerns. Now, I'm not going to focus on the issues with manufacturing in regards to batteries. Yes, material materials and supply chain is an issue as far as rare earth elements go, but I have discussed solutions in previous episodes. I'm not even concerned with the material limitations, seeing as Elon Musk and Tesla have found viable long-term solutions. But the reality is, with so many companies flooding the market with EVs, with prices comparable to today's standard internal combustion vehicles, and the rise of self-driving rideshare initiatives, it is highly likely that in 10 to 15 years, most vehicles on the road will be electric. And more electric vehicles means more more electricity usage. That's the issue, and it's a serious one. Let me explain. The U.S. produced 4,130 terawatt hours of electricity in 2019 alone. If we're going to replace gasoline as the primary fuel for everyday driving, we need to find out how much more electricity needs to be produced over the next decade. In 2019, we produced almost 143 billion gallons of gasoline. The average thermal energy content of gasoline is 33.41 kilowatt hours hours per gallon, or to better put that in perspective, enough to power an EV to go 100 miles. Now, based on those figures, we can do some quick math. We take the thermal energy content of gasoline and multiply the total amount of gasoline produced in the U.S. After doing this, we get roughly 4,768 terawatt hours of thermal energy. Now, one of the things I love about electric cars is they are insanely efficient, so much that it is estimated that electric vehicles are on average four times more efficient than gas-powered vehicles. So if we take that to heart, then all we have to do is divide the last figure by four and we get 1,192 terawatt hours of electrical energy. Assuming that's right, we now have an estimate on how much more electricity we need to produce. Weighing that against what we currently already produce in this country, we need to produce 29% more electricity to replace every gas powered car with an electric one. Now that's consumption at current levels. If we assume power demand in this country is going to increase between 10 and 12% percent in the next decade, then that figure goes up to 1,652 terawatt hours or 40% increase of power required in 10 years. Can we do this? Right now, 20% of our electricity comes from existing nuclear plants, and though those don't emit any carbon emissions, these plants are due to be decommissioned faster than suitable replacements can be put on the grid. And for reasons already discussed on the show, the idea of being able to replace all those light water reactors and make an additional 200 reactors in 10 years to meet new demand is not not just unlikely, it's impossible. Roughly 7% of our electricity comes from hydroelectric dams. They work fine too, but we aren't able to build more to exponentially meet increased demand due to location restraints. There are not enough rivers to multiply power output sixfold, so hydro is out. Between 4 and 5% comes from renewables like wind, solar, and geothermal, and we have a whole set of issues with those. For one, geothermal is geologically constrained to seismically active areas. Secondly, solar energy requires a great deal of scale and backup power to be tapped on demand, and wind requires load-following backup power. In addition, with the exception of geothermal, these intermittent power sources are way too diffuse to be competitive without subsidies. The remaining two-thirds of our energy comes from natural gas and coal. Coal is on the decline in this country with several plants that have plans to be shut down over the next decade. So we're effectively reducing one of our most reliable sources of energy while increasing demand. 
This leaves us with natural gas. It's cleaner than coal with fewer emissions and no ash tailings. From a market perspective, it's preferred by most utilities because it's cheaper to mine, it's cheaper to ship, gas turbines are the cheapest plants to build, and they are much faster and easier to permit than any other plant. The supply in the US is sufficient to keep things going for the next century, but this is at current levels, not factoring exponential growth. As time progresses, America will become more dependent on natural gas. As EVs keep entering the market, electricity demand will continue to increase. We will need to build more plants to meet said demand, and as demand for natural gas increases, the supply of reserves will decrease and the price of gas will skyrocket. At that point, this country will be unable to sustain our basic needs or we'll just not buy electric cars. I don't want this to happen. I love the idea of electric cars and want them to become more and more mainstream. But the facts are you have to scale energy production to meet demand. At the recording of this episode, the United States has just sworn in a new president. This administration will most likely be pushing for various reforms in regards to energy production and electric vehicles. If we believe that electric vehicles are a good thing, then we need to frame the conversation correctly to address the underlying issue. I'm speaking to both sides here. Republicans, whether you are for or against EVs is irrelevant. It's going to happen and using the longer tailpipe argument isn't going to persuade anyone. You need to address the ramifications of requiring 40% additional power production in the next 10 years. Democrats, your ambitions are admirable, but the idea that you could replace all fossil fuels with renewables in the next 10 years is a pipe dream. The University of Michigan Center for Sustainable Systems predicts that even with the most optimistic projections, 79% of electricity in the United States will come from fossil fuels in the year 2050. If you believe electric cars are the future and that increase in fossil fuel usage is untenable, then you need to include nuclear power in the discussion, specifically advanced walkaway safe molten salt reactor technology. So we know the problem. What is the solution? To me, there are two, the technical and political solutions. The technical is something I will never get bored talking about on this show. Using molten salt reactor technology, we can address both the adoption and technical concerns in regards to electric vehicles. Molten salt reactors have the potential to be mass produced on assembly lines to reduce costs and increase rollout of clean energy across the country. Using high temperature process heat, we can produce synthetic liquid fuels from various feedstocks to provide dry and replacements for petroleum-based fuels. Doing this on a large scale will address electricity supply and demand concerns with EVs, and for those who aren't going to be buying one in the next 10 years, well, you wouldn't be left in the dark either. The regulatory solutions to getting this tech moving in the right direction was discussed in episode 14, and for those who haven't seen it, I will leave a link in the description. The political solution is a bit more complicated because it's not something I can resolve in a 10 minute video or audio recording. It requires a level of awareness, will, and dissemination that our country's leaders do not possess. And for the average citizen, it's not as simple as just saying, hey, write your congressman. They need the tools to take action. Now, this may not be the best solution, but it's what I plan on doing this year. Over the coming months, as this channel continues to grow, we will continue to bring on various industry experts and leaders on this show. While while we continue to make compelling content, we will also be working on a number of materials and resources that can be easily distributed to everyone. The purpose of this will be to provide interested parties with the tools to spread knowledge in regards to molten salt reactor technology. We will identify process applications that can be applied to various industries for commercial benefit, the solutions to problems that can only be solved with the level of access to clean and abundant energy that this technology can provide. Most importantly, these documents will contain the regulatory solutions to allow this industry to grow and flourish. The hope is that we will be able to create a level of outreach that will get politicians as well as industry leaders on board to work together to solve our biggest problems. I plan to bring you updates on our progress in future episodes. For now, I'm Sean Kenny, and this is Rock Logic. So last week I revealed that I'm trying to get producer Jessica married and I'm using this platform to do so. Again, this Sean? week I'm going to tell you what she's looking for. Of course, she prefers her men tall, dark, and handsome, must really love dogs because she has two of them, they're large and energetic, and only listen to her, and they kind of scare me. Military experience is a plus, that's for your benefit, trust me. What? In addition, know your wines. She has broken up with men for putting Cabernet in the fridge. Best of luck to you all. Sean, you gotta quit doing this.